guys uh, oh, sir, he's got the jersey going strong if you if, 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 <laughs> he's got it going strong yeah man oh. if i'm gonna if i'm gonna sit in my house uh by myself i might as well uh put on the rep the color it's not gonna do it's not full kit though it's not john terry full kit like i'm ready to go in so uh just just the top just the top <laughs> Congratulations. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Today, I, I, I felt like Tammy Abraham and Hudson Adoy at the end of the match. I was just sitting there. I was like, I didn't think I'd feel so hurt. But I actually was. I was kind of just like, wow, what, just, what really just happened? Wait, 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 you, wait, you, you, you said, what you said about Tammy Abraham and Hudson Adoy? I said, I felt like them. Did you see how they were panning the camera and their faces and you could just look into their soul? They were looking like. Because they're winners, especially. especially. Well, I mean, they were winners. I think they were just the way they lost, like how they lost and how quickly everything seemed to happen. Like Kovacic got sent off. You saw like mad dudes get injured. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like. Uh... What we predicted for the game happened, just not mm -hmm. necessarily in the ways that we expected it to happen. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, well, we yeah, both I'll, predicted that there would be, there would definitely be both teams would score. And, right. And I called, I called two one. I went on the record two one to Arsenal yesterday. You, you did. It, it could have been three two easily. It could have, should have. There's a lot of could have, should have, would have. Well, I did, I did say though that both, like I was going out on a limb. Pulisic and Obama was going to score, which is you not know, actually Pulisic, you know, Giroud or, or Mount. It's not like Pulisic is like, you know, guaranteed to score 20, 25 goals yet in the season. So, mm -hmm. but I was like, I said, they were going to score. Like, he looked like he was on the fast track to being able to do it, how he was playing today. Man. <laughs> Yeah. See, and so here's the thing. This is, and you all came at me. You were like, "Yo, he's definitely going to start," and he definitely did. But like that, I didn't want to say it out loud. But like that was my concern. Like, I thought he was going to come in as a sub in terms as an impact player. But it's been a lot of games. I think we saw today, like this this season that has gone on so long now. Like it's going to be a problem, especially yeah. since like they're. They're basically – Chelsea now has to go do a Champions League game. <laughs> we have, <laughs> we now have the Community Shield game. That's oh, my right. gosh. I forgot about that. Wait, yeah. wait. Two weeks or three weeks? It's like it's in like two and a half weeks. What it's going to be like thinking? right before – it's going to be before the end of the month. So it's going to be, I guess, three weeks. F.A., what were they thinking or whatnot? By the way, we, we got all this great content already because the, the recording has started already. <laughs> I made sure the recording started already. So, oh you know, <laughs> that is something that we already got. And quick note, because I, I didn't even know. I, I, I didn't even look at the FA uh, Community Shield. <laughs> yeah, so we have a Community Shield versus Liverpool in, at the end of the month, basically. I think it's, like, on the 29th. Okay, that's uh, – that, mm, man, they really don't get any rest. Yeah, they basically aren't getting any rest because, again, if you're in the Champions League, you're going to play that out. Then so there's there's no there's not going to be really much of a preseason. That's your ba preseason is going to basically just be a walkthrough essentially. I told Leon they got it right. Leon President Alice wants to get mad at Emmanuel Macron saying, "Where's my money? Where am I going to get money or whatnot?" I'm like telling him, Leon's going to be so right, especially if PSG wins the Champions League, which I think over City and Bayern they will. Now, even though Mbappe got hurt, but in Atlanta is dangerous. Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta is very dangerous. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it without Mbappe, to be quite honest. Well, they, they need nothing they, they can get, especially because they're dealing with arrested Byron. That's the other thing. Like, well, well, I don't know about arrested. I mean, they, they because they, they had the Byron just played a friendly against Marseille, so they only had like a two – Week ish break or whatnot. Listen to what people said. They played a friendly against Marseille, whereas everybody else has been like battling for, well, for the past. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. PSG literally got a legitimate 
off season, and it's uh, you know what? You know the Arsenal fan is like he he's like put the attention I'm, I'm, back I'm, on. I'm down for I'm down for some Champions League talk. I think that that's the thing. Like, uh, well, that's there's always the double thing with uh, the with League Un in the in the sense of their the level of play at the top is not as strong. And then, like I said, I well, 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 Bayern, Bayern, I, I, I get, I get, too, and I get what, too, I feel like Syria, I feel like Syria uh, in terms of at least there is a top three or four to make it interesting for them. And then I think just because of the nature of the play there, it's like everyone can sort of be in the mix in terms of just an interesting game. Mm-hmm. I feel like in terms of like, we haven't seen on the, what is this, Bayern's what title in a row? Like eight six title in a row or something no, no, ridiculous? No, 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 no. Yeah. No, eight for them. Eight for them. Yeah. Um, eight? eight for Juventus, two, actually. Either seven or eight for Juventus. I think it's seven for Juventus. Seven for Juventus. Seven. Yes, I think it's seven. I'll check that right now. Um, but it's a, it's, let, it, let's, they, they make the Celtics in the 60s look like, well, they were just a one and done team. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting because one, you have, you'll, for both Bayern and for PSG, you'll have different levels of game sharpness and fitness because those, those friendlies aren't going to be the same. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Who gets up to speed faster? Um, I think it's also going to be, again, we're going to see, at least on the Prem side, we're going to see a couple of injuries going into this. So it's going to be interesting. Oh. By the way, Sila, we uh we cheated Juventus, so U of A fans don't get ready because y'all crazy in Turin, especially with your history. Questionable. Um, ninth straight. Uh. <laughs> ninth? We're not cheating them. See, by cheating them, we were trying to make the league look better. I just make the league look ten times worse that they won nine straight. Now wait, is that, is that nine? Is that nine including the ones that got taken away? Oh, the or? remember the ones that the remember when they got banned was in 06 after the world after the World Cup. So this has long been removed, and uh, I mean, like for a tremendous league that ill couch yo Syria is. And by the way, Miss Hale Bonetti, you're such a hater of mine. Um. It's just something that it's just something where it is fascinating to see this league really be dominated and how bad Milan and Inter has gone on. All I can say is that the versatility that we're showing right now, people, when this is supposed to be the FA Cup final review or whatnot, it's kind of starting to and, and, and why I have to discipline myself and say, well, let me do that because then I have y'all on for two hours and then I miss my haircut or whatnot to do or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really cool. We'll make we'll make this we'll make this quick. I think well, it's an interesting game, but I think yeah, we'll we'll keep it to FA Cup for today, and we'll save the Champions League talk for the Champions League NCAA talk for uh, another time. <laughs> well, all I can say is that um, Copa ninety gave us a wonderful, the great Sir Tom commented on the episode before you did um, JP, and then he probably commented on. So Tom, we appreciate you, good sir. Let's let's talk on the low low time about things and whatnot, and then we'll guarantee we'll stir you into the direction that the previous people, um, unfortunately, did not because they only cared about certain clubs. We got you, Tom, all the way. And on that note, on that note, Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen watching or whatnot, anywhere where you are at or listening or whatever there may be. And Jarrell Jones here, James Eddy, American Great Soccer, and once again, American Big Great Soccer, episode six, with a tremendous guest. We promised y'all that we would have a review, or we thought that we we're going to have a review of the FA Cup. And indeed, we did, even though I encourage you to watch the preview, because there's a lot of entertaining stuff, especially if you are a fan of Patrice Evra, Trey Songs, and even Lewis Hamilton, who got a um, pole position all the way in the British Grand Prix uh, this morning. Shout out to him. And no shout out to Periscope, who DMC ate me over just getting his quotes. Afterwards, as I told to James in the free call. Andrew L. Jones with the great start. James Eddie and Jonathan Priester. He is back all the way celebrating 
his beloved Arsenal getting a 14, 14 FA Cup record title and a bid to the glamorous Europa League. Hey, it's a good day. It's, it's, it's a good day. Um, I greatly appreciate you guys bringing me back on so we can do some post FA Cup uh, commentary, the Arsenal Invitational, as we're going to have to start calling it. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good day. I think the interesting part is we talked a lot about the tactics. We talked a lot about how this game could go either way. And I think, and James and uh, Andrew, you may agree with me, I think many of the things that we talked about yesterday in the last episode came to fruition, just not in the way we expected it. James, what are your thoughts? I think the same thing. I thought it was very interesting. I was like, oh, wow. Wait a minute. JP with the side pivot, like he's also now third co-host for this day. I see you, JP. I see <laughs> you trying to take away the shot. That was well smooth, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Never that. Go Never ahead. That. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting. You were right with the formations that they both, they came out 3-4-3. Three, three. I thought it was very, what made it even more interesting is you did both talk about how dynamic and parallel both teams were. And I felt like the game today, similar to what I was talking to Andrew about during our, the pre-call was kind of like, because the teams were so evenly matched in that, in that way, I, it was hard, like, People are going to talk a lot about the calls, the send-offs, the injuries. I didn't really want anything like that to happen because it felt like the game was so evenly met. It was so interesting to see two of score early, which was the reverse of what I thought was going to happen. I thought Arsenal was going to get the goal. But then I thought what was interesting was that Arsenal got the goal in the way that I thought they were going to get the goal, but I thought that they were going to be the ones to score first. So, mm. like, I knew that that goal was going to happen. I knew it was going to look like that either – Aubameyang was going to score himself or he was going to earn a penalty. Um, so I thought that was really, really interesting. But similar to what you just said, JP, it's like we, yeah, it played out the way we were kind of talking about the sense. I feel like we had the feel of the game. Mm -hmm. We just couldn't write the script as accurately as it played out. But we knew, we knew the characters. We knew who the, what roles they were going to play. We knew what the director and the directors were going to do. We knew what the stage was going to be. We just did not put the script together in the right, right outcome. But I think that also talks about what we know and how we know our team, right? Like, and I think of where they both are in that way. I thought the post-match conversation from the commentators was very, very interesting, mm -hmm. uh, especially in regards to Aubameyang signing again and what our has been trying to do and, things of that nature. I think that was really interesting. I think the drama think, of Pedro coming in and looking like classic Pedro. Are like, oh, you saying you saying the Barcelona Pedro, James? Yes, was, That's right. It wasn't even like the later crosses where you could tell he was like, I just need to get the ball in the box before he got injured, unfortunately. It was like I was saying to Andrew in the, Latin, uh, the FA Cup semifinal episode, I love when Pedro gets on because he still has that quality. It's like right when it looks like Chelsea's about to break, Pedro's the midfielder who comes and makes a key interception and gets the ball to the other side. So when he came off of you, I wasn't really as surprised because mm -hmm. I was like, if he if he's looking good, then this could play out better. He could still make those same kind of runs, and he's a little bit more defensively responsible yes. than he was in the end of the first half when all of that pressure was coming on to Chelsea, they really needed someone to hold possession for a little bit. And it looked like Pulisic and uh, Mount were really just trying to get back and get on the counter, which is a good style. But in that moment, they just really needed to hold possession for it. Just like there was a play where Mount went back and played the ball through the back again. It really alleviated a lot of the stuff that they were facing. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, we got a battle of the three, four threes in terms of formation. And it was interesting because it ended up being a game, even though they always talk about it, it's a game of two halves. Yes, yeah, so wait a minute, wait a minute, sir, Priest, sir. The, the, you mean to tell me they're trying to deny you this glamorous FaceTime right now? They're trying to deny your camera time? They're trying to deny your shine or whatnot right now? You know, uh, Wi-Fi, it, it giveth and it taketh away. 
So uh, it looks like I'm back. So, but, so you're saying Wi-Fi is uh, Roman Baramish and Frank Lampard today? Right? <laughs> well, so here's, so here's the thing. Let's, let's go back through the game. They both lined up. I think we both predicted it was going to be three, four, three battles. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chelsea came out hot out of the block. And it was more so of Chelsea dominating the midfield. Uh, Pulisic really sitting in that hole behind Giroud and wreaking havoc. Uh, and I think we were about five or so minutes into the game when uh, the first, really the first uh, shot on target from a Chelsea perspective, uh, and it ended up being a goal. Pulisic drives in uh, from the center of the field mm -hmm. uh, and then lays off, keeps his run going. Drew doing what Drew does with a nice little flick. Boom, bang, they score. Several minutes before, uh, again, going back to what we talked about yesterday about goals changing games, several minutes mm -hmm. before, uh, Aubameyang had a really good chance for an almost an open header that he shoots wide, and it's like, dang, is that, yes. is that, that the was, moment? And that was a is great, that that was a great um, delivery by Nate and Miles, who I've always felt has been very underrated. And he, to me, was just once again, I'm like, this guy is really, really good. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised that he doesn't get more pub, and he's still very young. Well, I think one of the things with Maitland Niles is that he's so flexible as a player. Yeah. And uh, it's really about, and he's been forced because of injuries and just skill, he's been forced to play a lot more defensively than he would like to. He really sees himself as a midfielder. Um, and then Saka got a run in the team. Saka is a little bit more offensively inclined, was able to do some things. But Maitland Niles, again, did a great job, excellent job today. Uh, really put to bed a lot of the demons he had from the last final at the Europa mm -hmm. final last year. So first we have five minutes in, boom, Chelsea gets ahead. Really at the point of the goal, Chelsea still is getting the majority of the play. Yep. Um, Arsenal then is forced to still soak up a fair amount of pressure, but then it has to come out a little bit more because now they're behind. Uh, we get to the water break. Uh, mm -hmm. And the water break is now coming like a coaching session yes. uh, for for the teams. Yes, and JP, I don't free with it because I was texting with J me and James were going a little bit back forth in the text. And after the water break occurs, because <laughs> um, I was a little, I was lunch a little behind on the ESPN stream because I was just trying to get things for Instagram for it, as you saw. And um, James, <laughs> after the water break. Um, you know, the, 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 the captain says that I put, that's Billy Quetta, you know, um, you, you had, um, your interesting comments, James, that the fact that you said oh. in your text and whatnot overall about, um, that key moment that really, um, uh, turned okay. tied back to Arsenal, really. As a Chelsea fan, as Billy Quetta is kind of like the linchpin. And because he is in the Lincoln, he's always involved in the drama. But it feels like every time Chelsea has a lead, it's like him or Marcus Alonso gives up like a crazy run where you're just like, yo, I, like even the uh, announcers were kind of dumbfounded. How, why, how did you let – the only way he's going to get by you is if he runs past you. Why aren't you giving him five yards? Like, you know, and that's what gets him now with Astro Quinta is like, it's one of those moments where it's like, we don't need you to come forward, right? Like, mm. it reminds me, I was going to text you about Rudiger as well. Like, hit, watching Rudiger sometimes drives me crazy as well because there's moments where it's like he's trying to do too much. Yeah. And it's one of the things it was with Astro Quetta, especially with that run. It was like, dude, you don't need to have to do that much, right? Like, just shore up your side, and then when you, it's time for us to move forward, you move forward. But it literally was off of a goal kick out the bat <laughs> that they gave up. It wasn't a goal kick, but it was a long kick, I think, out of the, from the bat mm -hmm. that he gave up the run on. And it's like, there was nothing else. You weren't, we weren't moving forward. You just need to make sure you're responsible for your side. Yeah. And Rudiger, I, I was happy when Rudiger got taken off as well because I could see he was upset. But like I was saying, he <laughs> plays like he's traumatized from playing with such other poor, such poor parents. And he feels like he has to defend everyone who comes through the box. Yeah. And there were times when Zuma was responsible, and then when Christensen came on, they were both very responsible for who they had to deal with. And he was the one who was just like, where are you going? Where are you going? Like, there were so many moments 
especially on those set pieces in the end of the first half. I'm like, where are you going, dude? Where are you going, sir? Rudiger, he, the man is right there. Where are you going? Where are you going? Stay with your man. And you can't do that as the sole center back, like primary center back. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't. Well, I think... mm-hmm. Sorry, maybe. Oh, yeah, no, I was, I was just saying that I think it's interesting, though, but there was a, there was a tactical shift uh, at the water break where, yes, it was. Um, where you can see that whether it's Tierney, whether it's Maitland-Niles, um, whether it's Bellerin, like you can see that there was the idea then to say, like, hey, if they're going to press this far up, that we, gotta, we have that space to hit over the top. And the first mm-hmm. half of the first quarter of the first half uh, before the water break, Chelsea was doing an excellent job of pressuring, not yep. giving anybody, the playmakers, any chance on the ball. So mm-hmm. then what you start seeing is, hey, it was almost the, the antithesis of advanced football. You know, that's like long ball um, that you yeah. just see. That at, at, ugly at long ball. ball. That it's it's open, it's open. Open. Kick it up the field. Yeah, just kick it up the field. That's what they did. <laughs> so I thought, so yeah, so we end up seeing almost like a title shift. And we talked about this yesterday. The game went in waves. So Chelsea was in the ascendancy, got the first goal. Then we end up going to the water break. After the water break, Arsenal is in the ascendancy. And then we see them get the goal where, again, who was it? Asabia Coletta, like, is pulling on Aubameyang as he's gliding into the box. Aubameyang could have gone down earlier, but sort of just rides the challenge till he's in the box, goes down, clear penalty, sends Caballero the wrong way, 1-1. And then, again, the game is back on a poise, back on a knife edge. And we see that it really stayed that way while Arsenal was in the – then they were in the ascendancy. They were moving the ball around. They got more possession. The last – five minutes of the first half really ends up becoming just uh, uh, nothing but Arsenal pressure, but they don't capitalize on it. So from my sprint standpoint, we go into the halftime one, one. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is still anybody's game. Yeah, It was still 50, 50. And you know, the thing is, and by the way, I have decided to rename it since that you have to put it as Arsenal Invitational. I just say, I just say that the F and A just stand for the four Arsenal Cup right now. Oh, oh, okay. I just, okay. I, I just tweeted it out. Say, hey, I hope I beat somebody to it. I know all the Arsenal fans globally, hopefully, have said that before me because I'd be very disappointed or whatnot. Um, but it was still something where you were starting to see Aubameyang become like where he was with Danny Ceballos, you know, and this is why it's important for Stan Kroenke or, you know, who's ever handling Stan Kroenke's finance specifically with Arsenal, really make sure that they officially sign for Real Madrid because he could really be this guy, and he should have been a Barcelona midfielder, honestly, Danny Ceballos, instead of a Real Madrid midfielder. Um, it was just something with influences growing. At the beginning of the game, I will say that Lampard definitely got it right. When he put Mount in, in, in Pulisic in terms of made him narrow, as Craig Bradley was talking about, but anyone that saw it definitely saw it, where both Ceballos and Jacka, and this was a little bit on Arteta, like they were so far away from their back three that they just got passed through easily. Like literally, Kovacic, bam, to Pulisic, bam, to Mount, and then to Giroud, and then to the box, and that's how that goal happened. And it was something where you were like, well, this is a goal I would still, I would expect from. Arsenal a few weeks ago, not a, in a goal that I would expect from Chelsea right now, but so because your 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 holding midfielders were Jaka again, he was in the same spot as Ceballos, and they just weren't seeing what was happening, the danger by them. So that was the whole energy, and then Pulisic again had another chance on goal where you're like, well, Chelsea would probably try to get two if they could really get this, if they can really string it together, and. It was something where once that water break happened, and this is where I have to say now, after this contest, now Lampard, and we didn't, you know, fully address, like, and we'll address it with the um, second half, but I felt that this was the match where Arteta showed that he is slightly, to me, a, a little bit better in terms of a balanced manager, and it represents who they were as players. 
Because Lampard was always the attacking midfielder or the midfielder that was always about scoring goals. Or like that was the primary thing, was still offensive. Well, Arteta, throughout his career, even though he was definitely a, a very tremendous passer and unfortunate that he played in the same era as Xavi, Iniesta, Sergio Busquets, um, Xavi Garcia, where he couldn't get a sniff <laughs> playing for Spain. Like he literally, it was just like, Say if it was somebody, um, for example, if I could think of, okay, if it was Andre Iguodala in the NBA, where it's like, even though he played for the national team, like, there was no way he was going to be starting amongst prominent small forwards, even though he was an all-star. But um, it's just something where, you know, Mikel Arteta was a great player or whatnot, definitely loved by many admirers in terms of the, for other reasons or whatnot. <laughs> but um, it's just something that he, you know, really – it knew how to do defensive work overall. And I felt this match really showed that overall, particularly in the second half, at least before Kovacic got sent off, and it was 11 on 10. But um, the second half, you know, again, you thought that Chelsea, again, off the blocks, like like showing that they were wanting to be aggressive, showing that they were in, in control at the beginning. And then to me, the key moment, despite all the tactics and, all the changes, everything and whatnot for me, whatnot, is that moment where, and we don't mean to Americanize this people, we really do not, for people who are watching who are an American, we appreciate you. Um, it was, and they would agree with this, I think, is the moment when Pulisic is like running, getting full steam ahead or whatnot, you know, showing that pace, or deceptive speed, as some people would try to say. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just something that then, the main concern from an American standpoint overall with him and how I was just, I was just like, people were saying he's already American superstar or a superstar. And like, you may need to want to hold that because he's still very injury prone. And that hamstring, it just, it, from the minute, cause I was like realizing, wow, he's slowing down. Like, is he really tired from that run? And then I was like, wow. Then he's on the ground, riding the pain and slamming his fists on the ground or whatnot knowing that, damn, I just got injured again with the same injury that I had before. And the frustration from him, because it means so much to him, like, was evident, obviously. And I just think that that was a real, to me, a little psychological blow in the game for Chelsea, let alone, obviously, for him and all the mostly predominantly U.S. national team fans that were like, oh, my gosh, he got injured again. You know, so. I, didn't, I didn't realize how bad it was until I saw the, the attempted finish. Mm-hmm. I thought you know, when they showed the slow mo replay, and you could see him like actually pulling up and him yeah. taking the shot. I thought it was just you know one of those moments where it was like, oh, okay, he's slowing down a bit. I guess he's trying to compose himself a little bit before. And then when I saw the shot, I was like, oh, okay, what's up with that? Yeah, in fact, so psychologically, mm-hmm. I feel like I don't know. I don't want no. I don't think that. I didn't think that was a tactic. Mm-hmm. Like, Psychological shift. Mm. I felt like it was a psychological shift because he was that flank was really the one that was making all of the runs. Yeah. So that was the side that I think Arsenal was most vulnerable on. So it was just about I thought the substitution for Pedro, I think what really was hurting was the lack of physical play in that kind of gap that you and JT are referencing for the for Ceballos and Josh. I thought that was where a lot of the tussle of the game was. Mm -hmm. And depending on how that play in the middle of the field was allowed, I don't want to be the Chelsea fan who's talking about officiating because, like I said, I thought the better side on the day one. Hmm. But it wasn't allowed to be as physical as it could have been. And a lot of ticky-tack stuff was controlling and dictating what could happen in that midfield. Mm-hmm. And there was a couple of times with the Bios and Jocko both knew, like, if I extend my leg and yell loud enough, yeah. Is a chick. <laughs> well, that's the thing, Jane. Before I ask JP this or whatnot, you know, because a lot of people said clearly they thought that Arsenal was the better side, which I'm, I'm still like, well, it was a real 50-50 game, you know, and and I feel if that hamstring doesn't pull out on Pulisic there, I feel that he would be good enough to score that a goal, then have a great another great goal, great brace. It's two one. And, well, I said from the outset, I thought it was going to be 3-2 Arsenal, um, pending, like, everything, like, be normal or whatnot. And even with N'Golo Conte 
supposedly that, but that was more like a decoy, really. He was just in the stand. Well, he was available. But I thought that, you know, Chelsea would definitely, but I felt that there were two goals, like, fully in them at least. And I, I feel, I just felt that even when Arsenal were four, bombing second, that it, that it wasn't, it was still, despite the Chelsea injuries, and that's why they officially not, I feel, I feel it's more of the injuries or whatnot, where you, you, if you're Frank Lampard, or if you're like a, you know, the Chelsea fan that you are, or Mike Ryan Ruiz of the Leopard Star Show, where he probably doesn't want to even look at the whole thing, this whole thing and whatnot. I just feel that. Like, a little more passionate than I am. Oh, yeah. Very much so. And then he had Larry Nance Jr. on, the, on, on there, so he's really passionate himself. Um, I just felt that it was the injuries more, and then once again, Chelsea's um, that leakiness in defense overall that I felt was the real reason that Arsenal really, you know, won this one. You know, JP and JP, you can talk about that second goal, you know, and all that, man, because that was certainly lovely from Hector Bellerin. Woo! So what I would say is, one, I would agree with you partly. So mm-hmm. I think that it's without a doubt the Pulisic injury um, at the time that it happened, was uh, a momentum swinger in the game. That being said, um, I think Pedro came in and played really, really well before mm-hmm. he got injured later. I think the one that actually was the decider in the game was, one, the, the injury definitely played a role. I'm not going to lie and say it didn't play a role. But I think the game, the thing that actually played the decider in the role is when uh, Aspilio Aqueta ends up getting hurt because mm-hmm. he had more pace to deal with the pressure that uh, Aubameyang, Pepe would present to the yep. back line. And he also was that – he was the club captain, so he's like the calming influence on that back line. Yes. So yes. I don't think that there's anyone yes. there then to provide that sort of stability uh, when that happens. So when – again, so Pulisic goes down early in the second half, Pedro comes in, and Pedro was doing much of what Pulisic was doing in terms of making those in-swing runs, really causing havoc, and because uh, Holding couldn't keep up with them, just like Holding really couldn't keep up with uh, Pulisic. So that, I think, was not a like-for-like like because of age and talent and whatnot, but it was something where it's like they could manage with that. When Asimov Quetta went out, that's when you saw a lot more shakiness going into the back line. Uh, and I think that's where, again, you see with the Bellerin goal, I think it was a good tackle by the – I forget who was the defender at the time. Christian, Christian, yeah, who played, Christian who, who, goes, that, was a great, that was a great tackle. And I it, just said, fell, it just great. fell right to Pepe. Yep. Uh, Yang still does a lot of cooking before he shoots Ooh, that, that yeah, thing off. I, I personally thought that he had overdone it. I was like, oh, well, no, he's missed his moment. But he <laughs> stood up Rudiger and chipped it over Caballero. So, like, I think it was the defensive injury that ended up uh, costing uh, that second goal. But then again, even with that second goal and we're up 2-1, I, as an Arsenal fan, I did not feel that we were controlling the play, controlling the game. Uh, and then, of course, and I'll throw it to you, Andrew, we have the red card that comes for the second uh, yellow card. And I think that's going, that it ends up being like the final sort of, I won't say death nail, because Chelsea still continue to push even with the 10 men. Mm-hmm. But I think that's where we see it become a very different game. Because then after that, mm-hmm. Frank brings in all three of the offensive changes and just goes all for it. And we see just really a choppy sort of game at the end of that. But yeah. I think from an Arsenal perspective, they did what they had to do from – in similar vein to what they did to Man City in terms of soaking up pressure and being as clinical as possible. Because I was looking at the stats for the game. Mm-hmm. And when really I yeah. pull up the stats, what do we have? So we that have a total of three shots on target yeah, for Arsenal, true. three shots on target for Chelsea. So one goal out of three – for Chelsea, two goals out of three for uh, Arsenal. Chelsea still, even at the end with the numbers going down, had more possession. So, yeah, I think injuries and the red card played a role. But I think, again, it was the, the – if they were looking at an injury that made a big difference, I think it was less so the Pulisic injury 
and more so the Aspilita Quetta injury because that really added to an already shaky defense, a slow and shaky defense. And that was something mm-hmm. that ended up contributing to the second goal uh, and really just that's all she wrote once the red card came out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, James, you can sound off on um, Kovacic. Um, that, that sent me off right, you know, right away because um, that's something where you <laughs> definitely have what you want to express with that. <laughs> and Frank Lampard was uh, after, the, after the match. She was like, we can't, like, it's ridiculous that we can't challenge a yellow card. And, you know what I mean? He's practically very well, right. What I was going to say is the Rudiger – when they took Rudiger off, it was a tactical switch, but I also think Rudiger, like, was going to lose his mind. And I was with him. Like, that time when he, like, did not want it. I could see in his head, he's like, I'm going to punt this ball out of the stadium. If you call another tinky tack foul on us, it was just like, what? The first one, okay, I get it. It's fast. The first yellow. The second yellow, I was like, did you really – because he gives the yellow first to Ceballos. Like, you see that, right? Like, he goes the first yellow, his yellow to Ceballos, and then he walks over to Kovacic, and I'm like, he's yeah. not about to give him the second yellow yeah. and send this dude off on a ball that, on an over, it's barely an overextension because he won the ball. Like, he won the ball, and then caught the man after. And, and by the way, by the way, that first, the, the, that one was, that, but, you know, we, we all, people, because of that, we forget about the the first yellow that he got, where Granny Jaka basically planted his foot and tried to stomp on him. Now, yes, Kovacic did lose the ball or whatnot. So the first, the first, I'll give you the second one being a super soft yellow that shouldn't happen to a red. The yeah. first, the first one was a uh, was a, yeah. a foul. Yeah, it, it, it's tough because. Yes, he did lose the ball, and it's it's up, and it's the, it's incumbent on him to not be aggressive more than the person that's you know about to get the ball. But um, Shaka went and just basically just stomped. It was like he practically was, was trying to stomp on him, to stop his momentum, you know. But I give the ref a break when there's a slide, like sliding collisions like that. <laughs> especially, I give them a break, right? Like because it's moving fast, it's a quick game. Especially, it's a lot easier when you're watching from home to be like, oh, so yeah, I wasn't too, the announcers were a little bit more upset about that one than I was, it's, yeah. but that second one was just absolute. And then I think it was also very hard for me because there was, I think there was a time during the second half when we were facing, when Chelsea was facing a lot of pressure. I think they gave a word of the corner kick and it was on a ball that Caballero looked like he didn't touch and then looked like it touched a Chelsea player. And it was on an Arsenal cross. And I was like, and then they were like, the announcer was like, it looked like he missed it. And I'm like, I'm sitting miles away and watching this on TV. And I can totally see no one touched that ball. I'm like, no one, the ball doesn't change. So I was like, how did you guys get that? So I was already just like, okay, that's a little weird. And then some of the way the, so I, I was with Rudiger. Like if I, I was Frank. I had by that time. I had already lost it. I would have. I was ready. If I, I was. That's why I, I said I was with Hudson Adoy. I wouldn't have shaken his hand. I don't want to speak to him. I don't want him to come near me. Damn. Because that, that was one of those games as a player. I'm just gonna flip you off because this game. It's too close. It's too close for you to unless it's like egregious. Mm-hmm. It's too close for you to be to to find your way into it. And I didn't think the second call was egregious enough to warrant a yellow. And I, it, I don't know if it was because there's no fans. I don't know. It just was, it just seemed like everything was just kind of that way. And I'm like, I can't stand that. Let them play. Let them play it out. If they are being a little too aggressive, you have to kind of sway it to one side. But I didn't feel like they were being aggressive. I felt like it was kind of like, there were some calls where it was just like that's in the midst of the play. And because it's the FA Cup final, it, I don't know, is that an extra foul? I don't – like, it was – that's what made it a little funny to me. That, so, and like similar to what you said, JP, that, that was it, though. Like, after the red card, I was like, that's it. Like, I was happy that they were still pushing. I was happy that they still gave the effort for it. I was 
really surprised that they didn't concede a third goal. But after that red card, it was like, I'm telling you, like, I was a Rudiger. Like, take me off. I'm going to punt this ball out of Wembley Stadium and take me off to the field. The Berlin black man came out of Rudiger. It, it, like, the, like, the, like, the Berlin black man that he is or whatnot came out of Ant on Rudiger. There. I feel like if, Rud- if Rudiger should have been mad about anything, he should have been mad about being like flat footed and stood up in the box with like he had the <laughs> angle on a I box. More, more. That's where I she that's where he should be. Because Marcus Alonso at one point when he was coming back, he didn't run he didn't run towards an angle because you knew the shot was gonna come from a bombier. So like in my mind, I was like, I didn't the chip was the blind, him stand, getting stood up was even better. But Marcus Alonso ran into the box like he thought Rudiger was going to be able to handle Aubameyang one-on-one. I was like, he's about to get toasted, my dude. You need to go to the line. Like, he is about to get toasted. And, like, by the time he got toasted, the chip was sailing past the goalkeeper. And Marcus Alonso is the last man the ball passes. I was like, that should not happen. Like, you were worthless. You were absolutely (laughs) worthless. Jay, you know, it's so funny because Rudiger, he had one moment early in the match before JP – I uh, talk about the end and how Emilio Martinez really, really solidified himself all the way even more and how he's even grown. Uh, Rudiger had one funny moment where I was like, this is really not in the when he, Nicholas Pepe him, was isolated one-on-one, and he actually handled it pretty good or whatever and was able to <laughs> tackle Nicholas Pepe, at least get the, the ball. But, he, but, that was a, but that was a moment that was a rim and was like, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they want. You guys already I wanted Rudiger out of the game because I'm telling you, in the second half, homeboy was running around looking like I saw Zuma had his guy. Christian, poor Christian, just gets on the field. He has his man cup. I literally saw Rudiger ping pong. I'm like, who are you? You are supposed to be, if it's not Astro Laquetta, you're the next lynching, right? Like, those are our two consistent people, right? Astro Laquetta is gone. We just saw this man get car stretching off the field. Poor Christensen's coming in. Right before he comes on, he, like, takes off his shirt five minutes before. Yeah. He's looking at him. He's like, where do you want me to go? <laughs> and then they have to get Word. Every time Mount or Pulisic gets the ball, they lose it because they're going for these long through balls. And I'm like, just hold the freaking ball for it. Give them a second. Like, the man just got on. And I'm telling you, there was, like, four or five, two or three corners where Rudiger is, like, manning no one. And I'm like, dude, this is that's what you this is what you do. That is, is I've talked to Andrew a lot about Ruger's willingness to come forward and be more concerned about getting his head on goals instead of getting his head on balls he needs to clear. So he was already driving me crazy. I did agree with him about wanting to put the ball at the stadium, but he needed to go a long time ago. Like I was if they had anyone else, I was like, he needs to get off the pitch because he's he's gonna be the reason. He's gonna be the reason. Yeah. So that was basically my my issue. I was like, you gonna be the reason. James yeah. is that, James is not buying an Anton Rudiger jersey anytime soon. James, people at Roma um, understand your frustration, no question about it, because those have always been the concerns of Anton Rudiger's career, even though he was a very promising, just like um with uh, Jonathan Tai at Bayern Leverkusen. They thought, oh, we're going to have two black center backs to Germany, along with Jerome Boateng, obviously, but two real stout ones or whatnot, because Boateng used to be a right back um, in his days at Manchester City. And, um, yeah, it's just something that um, that's just been the case. He's still young, but he's someone for an elite club. Can't be a starting CB, as we talked about before. You know, overall, man. And um, well, part of it is I'm being 100. I'm being serious with that too. I think part of it is he's traumatized from having to be the like. There were moments where in past seasons where he had it was him and Conte, and that was it. Like those are the him, Conte, and Aston Villa, and they he's been in games where like some Liverpool games where they are getting absolutely assaulted over and over and over again, and the only reason the game does not end up 10 to 2 embarrassment is mm-hmm. because he's doing amazing things and marking several people at the same time. And I could see, like, you could see the wheel spinning of him trying to do it. And I'm like, but you don't need to, right? Like, you have to take your – this is a moment where you can be responsible for what you need to be responsible for because your lack of responsibility is going to be the cause that causes the drama. 
Yeah. So, yeah, the actual quite a injury, I felt like, yeah, that was a huge part. But, yeah, I was ready for him to go a long time. It was like, get him, get him out, get him off, get him off, get him off. Well, JP, someone that you're definitely not ready to see go at all. In fact, you're ready to see him see if he can definitely be, like, one of the more solid goalkeepers fully next season in the Premier League and in general and globally overall is, you know, Emilio Martinez. And this is something where I say with, for Vern Leno, and it's crazy because Vern Leno, along with um, Kevin Trapp and Loris Karius, if you remember Loris Karius of um, Liverpool two years ago but not – these three talented, very talented Germans and still young goalkeepers, they were supposed to really challenge Manuel Neuer and Mark andre Ter Stegen as the next way. And they're like, damn, Germany's got all these goalkeepers. Like, they, like I mean, Germany's got everything. Like, they're like four or five deep. And, bo- like, Karius, when he moved to Liverpool, you know, and Kevin Trapp when he moved to PSG. And, you know, and then Vern Leno now going to then Arsenal. And it was like, with like, but um, with 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 Karius, you know, great shot stopper, but terrible in terms of with crosses, lost his confidence, disaster for Liverpool, and practically the reason, although Sergio Ramos concussed him, why they lost to Real Madrid that you know that final overall, and Gareth Bale scoring a brilliant goal, um, and then Sergio Ramos starting Mo Salah, his <laughs> And then um, and then you know Kevin Trapp. Well, his thing that was his claim to fame at PSG was, um, you know, getting the attention more Rihanna <laughs> in the stands and whatnot than uh, being like a solid goalkeeper, Fonzo Areola, really a starter. And then it's so bad that they had to get Gigi Buffon from Juventus. And Kevin Trapp had to go back to Iron Track Frank. And Bert Leto, Bert, you know, you got a good rep- great reputation at Bayern Leverkusen. And you come to Arsenal and you know, even though you have promise, there's a lot of issues overall. And I think that Emilio Martinez we talked about last night fully, you know, is truly now the guy, you know, at Arsenal overall. Wise, you can't join us now, sir. He just said yes, yeah, so he's going to have to join. I would tell him to join us, but it's too, he's going to have to catch on the next episode. So oh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off. I, you were right with the other two. Burnt Leno, if he hadn't gotten injured, would mm-hmm. be in contender for one of our players of the season. True, he true. Had a, he had, he's, been rel- he's been a bright spot behind an incredibly creaky defense. And really the only issue that we could say is early, and I, I put a lot of this on Unai Emery, when we were early in the season trying to play out the back, he seemed very indecisive, wasn't very sure. Okay. Um, so I would put that more so on the lack of system clarity than him. So he really has to put a foot wrong this year outside of getting injured, which is not his fault. That being said, there's going to have to be a lot of discussion with the hierarchy, with uh, Mikel let Arteta you, around. Let me ask you who, said that. What does Martinez, you think, do, does better than Burt Leno? I think, he, I think he's much more confident with claiming crosses uh, in the air. Uh, I think he is more confident in his distribution with his feet. Uh, mm. I think that he's someone who, mm. while I and I'm sure many other Arsenal fans have been holding our breath every time we try to play out the back, um, he's someone who has, all, at least so far, um, he's made the right decisions, he's distributed the ball well, and I think that confidence that he has, even when the defenders around him are a little shaky, mm-hmm. He's someone that gives them confidence because he, his distribution, he feels very comfortable with the ball at his feet. He moves, with, he moves really well with it. He distributes it very well. I think he is a little bit better at the feet than Leno is. And if Arteta is, as a disciple of Pep Guardiola, we know that he wants his goalkeepers to be ball-playing goalkeepers to be able to help start the break of the press. So mm-hmm. I think that... As of right now, he is the undisputed number one. And I think the question then has to be, are we going to retain Leno, give him a chance to fight for the spot? We have two really good goalkeepers. Or is it that, hey, this is going to be an opportunity while he still has a relatively high stock for him to, uh, to leave? 
and for us to try to recoup some funds to invest in other parts of the, the club. Yeah. My vote would be to keep him, yep. uh, help him through his rehab, and then allow him to compete in earnest at, throughout the year. Because I think from his perspective, I don't think he will be as patient. Well, I know he will not be as patient as Martinez has been. He's going to want to play first-team football. But I think that's one of the big decisions. And I think we've talked through the game. Now it's like, what does this game mean for both of our clubs? Mm-hmm. For, from the Arsenal perspective, it gives a platform because it puts us straight into the group stage of the uh, Europa League, which is valuable dollars we have to have. Uh, we've seen tangible progress under Mikel. And now it's around, one, making sure the board invests in the, the signings that uh, Mikel actually wants. Two, figuring out the goalkeeper situation in terms of if you're just going to say that, hey, they're going to compete and we'll see what happens because Burnt is still hurt. Mm-hmm. Or three, and three, uh, we have to do whatever we can to retain Pierre Emmerich Aubameyang. Ooh, like, I'm telling you that thing before you go into the gym. Um, with, with Chelsea, because because I have an interesting uh, comment to say about um, their um, mixture or whatnot. Um, this is something where I say I said the other day. I don't mean to upset you, Arsenal fans. Lies, watching later or whatnot. But I had forgotten that you know he was like running down because he really sort of just got there really, and then but still has the contract or whatnot. And he's very much happy in London, and he definitely enjoys the London lifestyle. This sir here, Emmett Aubameyang. But, you know, he is 31, though, and it's something where would, you know, Arsenal, you know, realistically, they, you know, won't be contending against Liverpool in City next season. And I feel United will be up there as well, which next season is next month. But, um, but they certainly still are very, you know, could be dynamic. And with Arteta, you know, and if they stay healthy, they certainly have the organization and tactical know how to really be a top four contender. I think for sure, especially with the points total, the points total this low. If Leicester City can be prominent contenders, and definitely Arsenal can, no question about that. But something that says to me or whatnot, if I was someone at Anfield, and I said straight up, as I will reiterate, you know, again, you know, that I feel that for Liverpool to really stay at that level that they are. Because this season, Liverpool got very – their defense was so great and their midfield controlled a lot of games when they got up that it was just tough to really come back and stuff. But they still won a lot of games one nothing, Or still won a lot of games by just one goal. And they didn't score enough – a lot of goals compared to how City went and just scored the brace-off goals that, you know, City has bought Nathan Ake. And they look like they're going to solidify their back line with Ake and Laporte. You know, because John, uh, John Stones will be a good number three, but then yeah, it, it will be Ake and Laporte, most, for sure, as the center backs. I think if your team, and this is why it's going to be a little nervy for Mikel Teta when he celebrates tonight and everything, that Pierre, like, if I was Liverpool, I'd be like, look, hey, you know, <laughs> like, can we out? Uh, Convince you, you know, you're 31, and they're like, you know, Arsenal. I mean, the thing is, he's 31, so we can only give him this amount of funds. And we can go after Shira Mobley, and we can go after other people, or whatnot. We can go after other people. The thing is, that's key is that we can maybe entice you to be our lead forward. And, you know, you may not be the passer that Firmino is, but you still link up well, and you can lead a line, and you can certainly score. And um, as Jay's shaking his head because he doesn't want that because he doesn't want the he does he's scared of the thought of a Bobby Yang on, no he's scared of thought about Bobby Yang on Liverpool. Bobby Yang, it, it doesn't. I keep you and your the Firmino take. It doesn't make it. How it make, he's changed. <laughs> Even though Firmino's a great playmate, he's always been a great playmaking, but he's he's paid. To score so goals the, primarily, and he's an inconsistent he's finisher. That much more sublime that he's going to add that much more to what Liverpool. Yeah, he will is. because he's slightly he's, he's not the pass that for me is, but he can still pass and connect, and he's a better finisher. And like and and, and, and if if Liverpool do get Tiago, because they were they were far outside of Tiago, I think it would make sense that he would be one of the options or Harry Kane. Or Chiro Mobley, as I said, where you're Liverpool. You know, like, you're like, you're up to the Barcelona now. 
my mind, in my mind, I can't even think of a different sport to like try to think of the analogy that I'm trying to come up with in my head. Oh, we're like splitting hairs there. To me, it's it's not. But that's but that's the that key though, Jay. Quality. It is we're splitting not, hairs. Like, it, it's yeah, but they they're not. They don't need to get. Aubameyang's not gonna give. So maybe Liverpool wins more, a couple more games, two to nothing. Yeah, I, I, I think right, it's like, different because they got they got fortunate a lot of times this season. And then they have to go ahead and they have to make that same chemistry, have that same balance, do all those same things. Now with having someone in who's gonna incrementally make them a little bit better, well, maybe. You make a good and then point on that. Hockey, playing yeah. in Liverpool, like that's yeah. it's, well, it's a huge <laughs> risk. It's a huge risk with little payoff to me in my mind. What, 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 what do you mean? Wait, wait. Little payoff? Like, it's a huge risk. You're, you're, no offense to Divac Karigi, but you're bringing in Obama Yang. Well, remember this piece. So, what more? Other than winning the Champions League, and I don't think the Obama I know, to bring them to that area, I don't think that there's that much of a switch. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember. They won the Champions League as JP enjoys our uh, Boston New York rivalry while his um Mississippi Calm self stays calm overall. First, don't let me show my Yankee. I'm gonna show my Yankees mask now, just right now. I'm showing my Yankees mask right now, uh, for my sister. Uh, the thing that's key is that you know, a uh, for like Obama Yang, really so instrumental for Arsenal team that even with when I am or whatever. If you don't have him, Lord knows where they would have been at before Mikel Arteta was there, all right? So this is the key now. This is the key. So Liverpool this season, the only problem for them was that their lead forward, or their lead forwards, you know, didn't really dominate in terms of the goal scoring chance to set Mo Salah, but he's a winger, all right? So in the mind, he's a winger, obviously. But still, for me, you know, he, especially when they play Atletico Madrid, because Liverpool should have never lost to Atletico Madrid. They should have advanced past Atletico Madrid. But when it came to some key chances in the game, and when you got a club like Liverpool, who's back at the top now, best club in the world, technically, I mean, technically they still are or whatnot, you want to have a forward that is truly among the best overall in terms of finishing, doing the main job. Kareem Benzema season tremendous. He could do that. Robert Lewandowski could do that or whatnot. Harry Kane could do that. Shirley Mobley could do that or whatnot. Bobby Firmino, tremendous playmaker, but he's an inconsistent. He's able, he's capable of scoring spectacular goals, but then he's capable of missing a lot of middle of the road chances at the top. And that's what happened with, in Atletico when there was a few chances. And then when Liverpool wanted to try to break City's points record against Burnley, you know, Nick Pope had a tremendous day. He has still had a chance, and he and he just and he just didn't finish it. And I, I know. <laughs> I don't think you're considering team construction in this entire thing. Well, I, 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 I did. I, I I said you had a good point because, especially in a pandemic. Well, you have gone back and forth about this all the time, and I'm like, you're not considering the team construction. No. Of your point is Atletico Madrid, he doesn't finish, but I'm like, their team is constructed very well. They're doing a lot of things. I don't think at forward it's that pressing of a thing. Like, if you were asking me to split a hair about one thing they need to split, but I don't think it's critical that they need to, and to me, to go out for Obama Yang like that and then work on the team construction, that can be something that's detrimental and vital because he's going to want his possessions and goals, and is that going to vibe? Because, like I told you, Mane is not who I'm worried about. It's Salah who I'm worried. I'm worried about uh, because he often plays as kind of that, you know, as the. I'm trying to think of a term. Are you trying to get back to the Mo Salah, Salah, Mane discussions that they had or whatnot? Yeah, I think they. I think they. They've appropriated it and they understand their relationship because, like I said, the three of them go for different things. I think. Salah is consumed with finishing. Mane is consumed with the perfect play. And Bobby Firmino is just like, I'm happy to be here a part of it. Like, and you need someone who kind of is just like that. Yeah. Like, mm. and Obama mm. kind of will play will dip if it's not, 
if he's not central in it, in the buildup. So that's what, you know, you're going to need that. Go sorry. ahead. I want to hear what they did. JP, I'm sorry that Tiariana Reed had to go in that the second best arsenal for it that you've seen. And by the way, JP, I could, you could say that he is definitely now over Emmanuel Adebayor and the great Kanu, um, the greatest um, African sport for Arsenal. You will say that, right? Well, yeah, he definitely beats Adebayor. Uh, I don't know if he uh, – Kanu, I'd I say, yeah, he's a better forward than Kanu as well. Um, but the game's a little different, so I don't mm -hmm. – different. I feel like this different eras, kind of. Uh, I would say if your core point is that top teams that have money and Champions League to offer – are going to be appealing to him, yes, that is 100% true. I actually agree with James. I don't, out of all the teams you could have named, I don't see him going to Liverpool. I just think that when we look at when Arteta came in, one of the things that he really just drove home was like, hey, I need everybody to commit. I need my forwards to drop back and or I need them to press as a unit and we would say that they do that reasonably well. The level of pressing that City does, the level of pressing that Liverpool does, that takes a, just a certain type of engine. And mm -hmm. at 31, do I think he could add to – I think he can add to any team. I think any team would consider picking him up. I don't know – I just don't think that Klopp would look at someone at 31. I think it's just very different from, like – Van Persie going to United, where it's like, hey, we have a deficit here that will definitely bring the championship back. I don't know if Klopp will look at it the same way with someone like Aubameyang. I do think it will be a matter of where does he, does he have the ability to fit into the system? Is it something where we've seen he, him be very effective coming from the wing? Does that then displace one of the other two players that are on the wing now that have done so well? Well, that's the thing. I would say that if he was, if he hadn't, but he's also proven his career that he can be a lead for it, that he can, he can line lead. He can, and, and he's interchangeable. So, you know, so that's, and that's why he's valuable to Arsenal. And, and that's why Lacazette is also great because Lacazette can be interchangeable, at least from the middle to the right, where, you know, he, you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, I feel like Lacazette is more someone that if you need him in the middle, because he's not going to stretch defenses by any means with his he's pay. Not. He's going to hold. He's great at holding up the ball, bringing in players. He is like a more, a slightly more mobile version of Giroud in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, which made which for him, I understand his the reason why he was salty when he was brought. When I understand why Giroud was salty when Lacazette was brought in because it was, in many ways, we thought we were getting a striker in the mold of Aubameyang, but what we really got was a duplicate of Giroud. So he's like, all right, this is kind of a like-for-like like well, position. He, he was, because when he was at Leon Lacazette, mm. not that he had the pace as, uh, obviously, as Aubameyang, but he, he was able to be that that, sit, that lead for it, that could then play, that could kind of cut outside, and then if you needed to, uh, cut outside, whatever, and, and then shoot this out from out of the box. Like, I can score goals from distance. Like, I have a real right foot. And so he, he had that ability to just not just be in the middle, you know, and, and, and that's why they came. She's good. Now, at Arsenal, I've been a little surprised that he's – and I feel like he's made lost a little bit of pace, honestly. Not that he was unbelievably fast, but he wasn't. But he still was, like, pretty – like, a decently good mobile and moved around more. Yeah, he's, than he's, he's, definitely, he's definitely mobile. He's not gonna. He's not going to burn past anybody. Like if we take the goals that Aubameyang scored in the semifinal, for yeah. instance, where he had the run in on goal, Lacazette, he's not that player anymore. He might have yeah. taken a shot further out. But again, all the side, we're not talking about Lacazette. I yeah. think that before there was a question like, hey, do do we get rid of both? Do we keep one? Do we like? I think that that was a lot of the things that were in play. I think right now that Mikel would, will be committed to maintaining both of them if he can. Lacazette is more in a more stable contract position than um, Aubameyang with one year left to go. Mm -hmm. I think that that is – and there's no way to predict this. I was listening to the BT coverage, and Rio Ferdinand was like, oh, he's gone. Like, that's – he didn't say oh, yes. Damn. And he was like, damn. he's gone. Like, damn. I don't – 
really believe much of what Rio says at all. Just in general, just the way I like to live my life. You say, but, you, say you listen to Grand Sunis and Roy Keen more than oh, Imperial wow. Ferdinand. <laughs> and shout out to Craig Burley. <laughs> It's so all, the way. All, all in all, so again, to, to wrap up, because I want to hear the Chelsea side of this. We talked a lot about, um, we went on a Liverpool rant for a while, you guys. <laughs> uh, but I think that the main things to figure out for the, for the rest of the summer, now that they have confirmed European play, is it's risky because he is an older player. We were in the very similar position with Mesut Ozil where we gave him <clears throat> a high contract for him to then be like, yo, I'm set and sort of rest on his laurels. I don't think Aubameyang would be in a, I don't think he's the same type of character. I think that we would still, <clears throat> if his body is still able to give it, I think yeah. we, will get the, we will get the best out of him. That's just like, just a fact. I think we will get the best out of him if he, Mesut unless there's a physical <laughs> injury. Mesut Ozil is he minding his business or whatnot, trying to, Celebrate it one night, you just like. Hey. Oh, no, it's just, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a comparison in terms of contract more so than like skill or anything. It's just like they, we were at a point where it's like, okay, do we re up with this person or do we try to cash in? And we made the decision, hey, we have to try to keep our best players. Uh, let's cash in and see where we go. I am of the opinion that Aubameyang is good for the club. He's good for the young players that are coming through. Yes, um, one of the things I think was very underrated when. Thierry did go to Barcelona. It hurt not only because he was a club captain and legend and all that kind of stuff, but I think it hurt from a dressing room perspective because it really was, now it's on Sesk to lead, and he was really young. It's on Robin Van Persie, who was injured often. So mm -hmm. I think that it's really going to be incumbent for us to try our best to keep Aubameyang. We have Saliba and other defenders coming in to try to work out the defense. But right now, the most important thing, if you told me if there's one, you can only accomplish one thing right now, it's got to be to keep Aubameyang. If we lose Aubameyang, then that throws a lot of things. And then that puts us into Frank Lampard 2019-2020 mode, where it's like, yeah, we're just going to really go in on youth and see where it takes us. But that's my take in terms of where we are. I want to know, James, what is this now? Now that this game is out of the way, with the way it's gone and the injuries, what does this mean for Chelsea? Well, what they said that um, – Look who was hoisting the trophy. Um, the guy who could be an MVP in Arsenal season overall. This good sir, Freddie Lundberg, who held down the fort when the, the building was burning down all the way. Shout it out to Freddie. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel so bad for Freddie because, you know, being a manager, it's all about opportunity and the, the, the setup and if you get a, a really good situation. Yeah. And he was thrown into a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that can, can rock your whole trajectory as a potential coach. Because now other clubs that may have looked at him, because he's been at, in the youth structure, and then he's been as an assistant coach now. And now he was an interim coach. Some people may look at that and be like, uh, I don't want to give him a shot. Whereas before, they may have given him the benefit of the doubt. But it was a horrible situation. The club failed him when he had that opportunity to step in as coach. And I think that that's, there's a lot for us to make up for. Um, we as a club have to think about how we treated Freddie and, and the situation we put him in because it showed that we were, we were running like a, a rec team. We were running like a minor league team. Uh, and that's something we got to make up for. Yep. Now, J James, if you want to put any capper in terms of Chelsea from what we've expressed with his top four finish still, even without the trophy. And honestly, I could say that, Again, the injuries to me were more a factor where you couldn't rest. I wouldn't be, I mean, obviously players are obviously got it and they would be, but I, I feel that Frank Lampard shouldn't be too dismayed by this, especially with a young roster, even if that was Willian's last FA Cup final to see with the club and, and all that. And that was fortunate. And Cesar still requests him. We don't know his situation in Pedro. I mean, goodness. Where, um, I mean, the man had like separated. He had, really definitely had a separated shoulder, it seems like. Um, with how he was stretched off and everything, and um, yeah, I mean, set with collarbone, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, no, I, I, that's what they were saying separated shoulder. I just remember when yeah. my friend broke his collarbone. Yeah, yeah, and man, you get that pain. Yes, yes. Oh, it's a hard. It's just, it's just even think about it. Really, like, thank the Lord that I haven't had that situation, especially playing football, Lord. <laughs> 
that's what they told the user. They just pop it back in. They just go, <laughs> yes, Bravo. It's so cool. Charlie Pink. <laughs> man, you uh, can, yeah, you like um, show the limb. that looks yeah. taller than me. Yeah, man, like um, Freeland, I'm telling you, with so many injuries that Chelsea has, and still having this Bayern Munich tie or whatnot, he may have to suit up Frank Lampard for um this game, or get John Terry from Aston Villa and play this game. That's gonna be uh. What I would like to see them do, Goodness. I think uh, watching today, what was very clear to me was that um, all hope for a potential Champions League comeback and maybe <laughs> Jay, stop it now. Did you really it get it? It was a small glimmer, a small glimmer. You know, they just come out there and they're just like, now it's like, nah, they're just, <laughs> it's definitely a wrap. What I would not like them to do, which is the very Chelsea thing to do, is think Frank, so similar to JP was position, where it was like, we need to establish who we're going to be before we start hiring another manager and throwing money at it again. I don't want them to begin now throwing money at it again. Oh, I would like them to So far, to, doing that. And that's what scares me, is because with the youth, they were able to have an identity, right? I like the fact that even though they struggle, they still struggle as a team. I feel like when you bring people in, I think Frank might be the guy to be able to lead that. I'm interested to see what the new signings will be able to do. Mm -hmm. I have been doing a tons of research on my center back game because that's what we need. Um, well, we that, 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 that time. Yeah. My love relationship with Marcus Alonso will continue because <laughs> there are moments where he just seems absolutely brilliant, and there's other moments where I'm just like, sell him tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm really interested. I hope the new signings don't take away from the the way the youth have been able to produce at Chelsea. I've been very excited mm -hmm. to see them understand play, understanding how to play. It'd be interesting, I think, to see some who will come back from loan and what mm -hmm. those negotiations would look like. I was going to ask JP, do he think, does he think we have a chance to get Leno now that it's That's pretty much... That's what I was about to say. Jesus, gone, say, say right? like, fine. Because the, the goalkeeping situation... That, a goal that, switch would, it, it, would it, go it, up. And that's a real problem because Kepa, they spent so much money record signing. And that's a really real issue because he's now angered two managers because, you know, sorry, like him had to blow up. And now, I mean, everybody globally has been like, wow, Kepa's horrendous. The 8% goals that says that. There was that with Shaka Hislop said that on, uh, for the goals or whatnot, Kepa was motionless. For at least 34% of the goals or whatnot that they buy up. Which is like Shaq was like, that's a big that's a big stats. And he said this shows his positioning is bad and show or his position not even there. I mean, he is like across the board, you watch because normally, as we talked about with as you talked about earlier with Bern Leno, JP, sometimes it's really your defense and then it's your coach that leads to you looking bad as a goalkeeper. But Kepa really is himself the reason why he's looking I'm bad also, at the goalkeeper. That was also part of the trauma, time, the trauma committee, as I like to call them, who <laughs> had went through some very traumatic periods where, you know, and, and in saying that, I do get what Shaka's saying as well. There were moments where it was just like, what I, so when JP was talking about Martinez, what I love about Martinez is he's aggressive, and if the mistake is going to be made, we know why he made the mistake, but I, I'm accepting of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I came out to play this ball. I might have missed it, but that's my style of play. I think what happens with Kevin sometimes is just like, there's nothing. It's <laughs> right? not like, change. You're right, because that's Curry Burley. When they played Liverpool, he heard the sound of the players literally yelling at Kepa, saying like, well, Kepa, where you, Kepa, where you at? And when he didn't claim, when um, when they almost conceded another when they almost conceded another set piece. So your examination and you see right there and Chrysler, and then once we heard the audio, he heard the audio because that was when they were able to watch it with no sound, like NBC sometimes doing the 
sound thing, when he heard the audio, when he heard literally the Phil audio, it was, it confirmed exactly what it was. He is not commanding. He, he, if the players are mad at him, like, rude him, like, they were really yelling, like, Kep, like, where are you at? Well, because the key thing is, we know that Chelsea will concede, they'll give up runs. Sometimes they'll, but usually if you're trying to get them through the air, the goalie and they're one of them, like, as the question, they usually pretty good aerial defensively, right? That's their, that's their thing. They usually have someone who's tall enough, a couple guys who are tall enough. Mark Alonso so tall and good with his head. Rudiger's good with his head. So the goalie doesn't have much work, right? It's more about, like, calling people off and saying, I got it, or punching, right? Which is what me made Peter Cech so well as well, so good as well. It's like, he rarely had to make saves where it was on his toes, right? Like, mm-hmm. aggressive, come out there saves, the, the athletic saves, I would call them, right? He rarely had to do that. It was, and it was only if his guys got beat, and they were getting beat so rarely on runs and things of that nature. So the aerial thing was never anything I always worried about. Then it was like Kevin came, and it was like, what the hell? Y'all can't be getting beat for headers, and your left back is bigger than – like, they would lose yeah. aerial battles against Liverpool. When I saw them starting to lose aerial battles against Liverpool, I was like, it's a wrap. Because Firmino's not good with his head. Mane's tenacious, but he's smaller. Solid, don't even get in there. Virgil was pretty much at one point, especially two years ago before they won this cup, he was pretty much the only person they had aerially who you were really afraid of, and they were still losing. Yeah. And it was just like, what are we doing? We have so much size. How are we losing these battles? So it drove me crazy. And that was when I was like officially like, okay. I was already <laughs> leaning towards him. I was like, I didn't see the hotness. Like when I saw Ederson the first time, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Like this dude. All right. I see him with his touches. His goalkeeping was less much some to be desired mm-hmm. I think he was pretty good but as far as being able to play at the back he was yeah one of the better goalies i saw in terms of composure and being able to do some stuff mm-hmm. yeah and, i didn't and, i didn't get that always looked kind of dangly and awkward which was, which is shocking because he did not look like that at bill bow and you know you saw edison and then once you saw allison becker then you're like yeah, hey. becker, you know yeah, he's another one. Yeah, but you can't get him from Liverpool. You can't do a trade of them asking for a, for them asking for a bomb. Well, sorry, Arsenal. Like, well, Arsenal can't do that necessarily. Well, that would be funny if that happened. I you're trade. You're that. trading my players for other people's keepers. A three-way trade. Uh, Liverpool trades Bert Leno. And Arsenal gets back. Uh, Liverpool trades. I mean, Liverpool. So Liverpool's giving sorry. away our Vern Leno. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Arsenal, all right. Arsenal gives away Vern Leno to Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea gives uh, Mitchie Baswai or Tammy Abraham to. Uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's getting worse and worse. Just, I, 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 just stop here. It gives them to Arsenal, and um, and and uh, Liverpool gets here Enrique Aubameyang or whatnot, and we call it a whole day overall. Oh, what kind of cross NBA? <laughs> I mean, hey, hey, it, it'll be the ultimate swap deal, as they say <laughs> overall or whatnot. Overall, you got you you will get two. Our, JP, you get two strikers. You'll so get I, so I lose Burn you know. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, oh, my goodness. I, so I lose sorry. Burn Leno and Aubameyang, sorry, sorry, and all sorry. I get is Tommy Abraham? How does this work? Well, well, I mean, no, 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 you get Tommy Abraham and Mitchie Baswai. You get two young talents because Mitchie's been screwed over. You get both of them, both Tammy upside still there, Mitchie upside still there, at least 10 years, like, well, t- at least Tammy Abraham is eight, nine years younger than Aubameyang. Potential, and then you got Reese Nelson, Bakari Saka. You got young players invested. Damn. Then you got see, you got that balance. Then you got Bert Leno. How did that? Everything, nothing you said made Arsenal better. It well, nothing. Nothing. Sometimes, (laughs) sometimes, nothing. It's not about getting better. It's about staying afloat. It doesn't necessarily mean it's about staying afloat. If not for Arsenal, if you were talking about Wolves, if you were talking about Sheffield, 
Look, I thought you know. somebody. I thought. I thought a fifteen-goal young English player or whatnot. Jamie Vardy wasn't doing things that Sammy Abraham was doing as a age. So Sammy Abraham, like, he's got that swagger, that feel, that could that could bust out and score 25, 30 goals or whatnot. I mean, hey, I mean, he was doing better than it. Andy Martial was in a little bit of right. And now does, 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 Tam, does Tammy Abraham get me into the top four? I mean, he got Chelsea in the top four. I mean, he's got he gave you 15 goals. He he gave you he gave you 15. He was very good at stretches. He got them in. He was, he was but he, he's not Obama. You just traded. Well, he should be. He's, he's still the finish Aubameyang to Liverpool. Obama, who was the key instrument in Arsenal winning. Well, they, I mean, he should. I mean, this is one of the best forwards in the world. In the this, same game. This is why one of the better forwards in the world would be a great center for it for Liverpool. He knew where I was going to go with that. Three-way trade. <laughs> no one else to say. This is why the Melanin podcast is that real. The Black podcast is that real. There's no one else is saying this global, especially the Black podcast, where Sir from Dorchester, Boston, me from Brooklyn, best city, sorry, Manhattan, we are real New York City, and then this great Sir Dale in Jackson, Mississippi, well, here in Harlem. But Dale Jackson, Mississippi, overall, whatnot, and that's just what – it no, is. You, 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 are, you are 100% correct about that. No other podcast is saying that there should be a three-way trade hey. where Arsenal gives up Burnt Leno <laughs> and Aubameyang for Tammy Abraham and Missy Bratswai. No, you, you have, you are exactly right. You got, no one your, else. You got your goalkeeper, Amin Martinez. Burnt Leno's hurt. He's hurt right now. So he's getting the value. He is 20. He's not like the 23, 28. And then Bill Martinez younger. I think that might be the first time in sports that you traded the star player of one game for another player who did not even start in the same game. Man, you guys are so down on Tammy and Mitchell Bisquire. That might be the first time in like sports history. It's like it. you guys have got Mitchell Bisquire was burning up for Marseille. So he's burning up late on. Burn, burn, burning it up for Dortmund a little bit. Not at the level of um, the wonderful – Urban Holland. I mean, my lord, this kid is just this is why United. Well, United could have gotten him for cheap. They could have got him for what for Richard Dortmund got, but they probably didn't want to make Anthony Marshall upset. But he's better than Anthony Marshall as Urban Holland. No question about that. But Anthony Marshall stepped up though. But long story short is that I still view both of these teams. James, you mentioned Nami Keppa, but I think, and this is the close on this for center backs. If they look at, I think they would be wise to look at Samuel and CC. Not a start at Barcelona, despite I think that he certainly deserves a start. Gerard Piquet, long in the two. Clement Lenle, yes, he may be a better dribbler of all, but not, but I want my center backs first to really still clear the ball and defend still. And I think Samuel cc has got a raw deal. He would be an excellent, you know, choice or whatnot, just for anything like that. But Nathan is now at, likely going to City. And then one of the Sheffield United um, uh, overlapping center backs. So I, I think there would be two players right there that you fear them with Zuma and Christensen. Be like, Rudiger, mm, you know, this is what it is and everything. I think even Rudiger, I think that, look, Roman Romovich, I already gave you the play right there. If y'all if, if haven't thought of this or whatnot, then I don't know what y'all doing to, because, like, uh, attack wise, y'all wouldn't got Bird and Zayich. All right, you know, you, you, you're all about attack, but you got to defend or whatnot, too. You got to defend if you want to be lead, like the Jose Mourinho when he was in his feet, Jose Mourinho. Um, and I love Jose, but it is what it is now. Um, you just got to do just that to have that balance overall. Um, on the final note, we'll, we can talk about MLS the next time. I, I really do want to give MLS love because there's some things that I am fascinated with, especially, unfortunately, fascinated for the wrong reasons. Um, Orlando, uh, Orlando City last night decided after they had their lovely one or whatever, they have their fans in the parking lot celebrating having smoke or whatnot. Yes, James, I was going to – hell, I need to just send, show you the video right you now. Know, I feel, you know, take the whole team out the bubble. Well, Nanny was he didn't know that was gonna go to he didn't know it was gonna go to but I feel you James, I James, I feel you all the way. They may be looking at us as strict 
And some people may try to call me again a Marxist out of nowhere. Oh, not, which, you know, I don't mind. I'm a Du Bois overall, if you want to know or whatnot. But uh, it's just something that, that look, I, I, I would just like, I, I would just like, who, who thought this was a good idea? Like, this is why we have the issues that we have or whatnot overall here. But um, but also, um, so JP, I really was gonna give MLS that coverage, but and I still do as I pop this up. But uh, sir, if I can ask you, who are you wearing as your Arsenal jersey? Because that's what I wanted to know. Who you were celebrating today on this glorious day, the 14th title of the of the four Arsenal Cup, you know, with number 14 Pierre Emerick Aubameyang being instrumental in that. Who are you wearing as a jersey, sir? Just, just the club. Uh, ever, <laughs> since, ever, ever since, uh, I've only had one Arsenal jersey with a name on it, and that was the 2006, so 2005, 2006 season, the last season at Highbury, uh, the red current shirt mm. uh, that had Thierry Henry's name on it. Uh, that was Ooh. the only one that I've ever gotten with a name. After that, I was like, you know what? I'll just rock, rock with the team. The, the players change, but it's like I, it's, I'm committed to the team. So, mm-hmm. no, uh, no, no names on the back of my jersey, and I still have in my dra- drawer uh, that Henri jersey. Um, I bought it again. This was like 2006, so you know, no one was wearing fitted jerseys. It was like, yeah, let me get this. In a, let me get this in an XL. <laughs> <laughs> so it still fits. As I was wearing my Keyshawn Johnson Proud Jets jersey all the way, all the way, I can understand that sentiment. Um, exactly. When did you become? When did you become an Arsenal fan? Exactly. Was it like oh one before high school, like or growing up? Or? No, no. Um. So I had become an Arsenal fan going back to uh, Americans didn't invent football. Uh, so you know, title Americans didn't create soccer all the way, but I love the yeah, you know. Americans didn't invent soccer either. <laughs> uh, the only way I didn't get to like start watching like actual games besides like you had to watch if you wanted to watch games it would be like either you had to buy like the tape of it like the VHS to watch it mm-hmm. of like classic games mm-hmm. or they would come on like randomly Hell. on like, wide wide world of sports or something. So mm-hmm. yeah. I became- and, and quick note. It used to be a time when you had to, well, sort of now, but for the FA Cup, even though Fox Sports, you know, world was doing Premier League, you had to buy it on pay-per-view yeah. here, which was, was wild. wild. So I would say I became a Arsenal fan before, the season before they went on beaten, mm-hmm. but I didn't actually get to watch Arsenal until the season after they went unbeaten because that was the year that Fox Sports Network uh, really started to blow up or started mm-hmm. being included in more sort of basic cable packages. Yep. So uh, what, they went unbeaten, what, 2003, 2004, right? I think yeah. so. I think, yeah, I think that was the year before Maria got there. Yeah, yeah, either that or so, yeah. So the year after, so um, that's that was when I finally got the chance. So when so before I had to like check the club website to see the results every game, and like I had to just imagine it's like okay, Henri got this goal at this point, and all that kind of stuff. There were no podcasts really about this stuff, mm-hmm. um, but really got fell in love with the club when I got to watch them uh, that following season, which was a rough season because that's where they went that 49th game, mm. uh, the, the 50th game, they went to Old Trafford and ended up losing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was the start of a dark road. So I'm sure a lot of Arsenal Woo! fans, yo, you were the one that went, made us go nine years without a trophy. Wasn't me, guys. I promise. Wasn't me. Hey, Shaggy, but, it wasn't him. Shaggy, yeah. it wasn't him. But yeah, so um, I would say became a fan before the unbeaten season and then like actually got to start watching like that 05 season, I remember the heartbreak of the Champions League final in 06. Like it was, and just been following ever since. But yeah, it's uh, been a long, me and, me and Arsenal have been on this road for a long time. But what is that, four out of the last seven FA Cups? Oh, four the, 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 four the, seven, the four Arsenal Cups. The four Arsenal Cups. I remember the ballot 2014, 2015, yep. and the back, the one in 2017. 
Well, all I can say is that um, to close out on this or whatever, as I promised, is um, even though this is supposed to be an Arsenal celebration for the four Arsenal and the pride of Highbury all the way, hashtag Arson come back. No, actually, Arson, you can stay retired now. You can enjoy that water slide. That water slide. I would love to close out on this, show him on the water slide. James, you know what I'm talking about? No. James, you don't know what I'm talking James, you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, my goodness. In fact, Orlando FC, you may be lucky or whatnot. I think, Orlando FC, you're very lucky because I would love to show you, and I'll put you on blast the next episode, Orlando FC. But um, because, James, this would be a great close or whatnot. I think it's fitting. Like, God basically gave me this old close or whatnot where you can see this all the way and just be blessed overall, people. Thanks to the wonderful people that made Zoom so JP can see what I'm talking about. There we go. There we go. Arsene Vena on the slide, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and on the slide. James, look at it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to then get back on the share and then be able to play clutch right now and then be able to close out and then put Arsene Ringer on the slide. You know, where people definitely got to see this right now, even if they hit an audio version anytime in their car. They have to see the video version with this overall. So as I play clutch or whatever, and get this going all the way, and get this going all the way, we will close right now with Art Amiga, right on the slide, so we can admire it right now. We can admire it right now. Here he is, there he is on the slide. There's the man on the slide. For James Eddy and for Jonathan Breesler as Arsenal, 14 FA Cup title overall. Israel Jones, American Senior League Soccer, episode six. Doing the trick. Arthur Vinga with the slide so thick. We out. Peace.